Jason. Right, this is where I get to talk about security. So I work with a company called Aqua in container security, and I'm interested in helping people protect their deployments. So I want to share a few thoughts today on some of the things, some of the tools we have in the cloud native community, and some of the things that we can do to save ourselves from being attacked. Even if you're not a security person, there are things that you can do to help secure deployments. My own background is in development, and I definitely used to think security is some kind of big, scary thing that other people deal with. And to some extent, that is true. We do have specialist security teams. They're the people who deal with incidents and handle uh, what, ha what to do when a new vulnerability gets disclosed. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this critical vulnerability <laughs> that was disclosed just a few days ago. And the good news is that thanks to the product security team in Kubernetes, there's a patch available for this vulnerability. I'm going to take this tweet and just modify it a little bit to add in the other members of the security team. And I think we also need to mention Darren Shepard from Rancher, who was responsible for finding the problem in the first place. And this team of people could well have saved all our deployments from being victims of a big data breach. So I would like to give this team a massive round of applause. Thank you to them. Now, every system has vulnerabilities, as Maya says in her tweet. And Kubernetes is a complex system. We should not be surprised. We should not be afraid of the fact that issues have been found in Kubernetes from time to time. Every system has vulnerabilities. This has been found and fixed. It's kind of an obvious thing to say, but if you haven't already, please do update your cluster to take that fix. So if you're up to date with the underlying platform, what else should you be doing to improve security? Well, the application code that you're running is potentially full of weak points that could be exploited. A lot of security issues come about because we're running code that contains vulnerabilities. And sometimes we're running that code uh, <laughs> due to user error or maybe user laziness. So let's suppose that you have some problem that you want to solve, and you go to Google, and you find the solution to your problem on some Stack Overflow page or some documentation, or maybe on some GitHub page somewhere. And we would all totally do something like this, right? Yeah, we'd just go, yeah, I'll take this, it's fine. <laughs> And I will totally just copy some YAML into my deployment. I don't know what I've run there. <laughs> and OK, hands up if you have ever copied some YAML from the internet and run it in a cluster. Yeah? <laughs> so it happens. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine that I'm like super malicious and I have, I've solved the problem that we were trying to solve. I've given you some YAML that does exactly what it was that you were Googling for in the first place. But in addition, perhaps I've installed something that's a little bit sketchy. I've made it really easy for myself by putting something in that is massively sketchy. So uh, I have, I've gone the wrong way, uh, I have given myself basically a terminal into my pod that's web accessible. <laughs> now, every pod runs under a service account, so it can have the permissions of that service account. By default, the credentials for that service account are mounted into the pod. So we can do something like this, run secrets, because yeah, it's a secret, Kubernetes, service account token, and we've got a variable that has the credentials or accessing the Kubernetes API. And then we could do something like this, where we could set up an authorization, oops, if I can spell it, authorization, 
with a bearer token. Also need to spell this right. Bearer token. And then I can just hit the Kubernetes API. Did you realize it's this easy to hit the uh, Kubernetes API? So from this pod that I have maliciously run on the cluster by getting somebody to copy some YAML from the internet, I've got access to the Kubernetes API. And uh, I also make my life easier by mounting cube control in here. And not only can I do things like get pods, I have given myself permission that I could do things like create pods. Oops. Yes, I could create pods. So that power is because of the service account that I'm using. So if we go back to the uh, YAML that I deployed, as well as deploying some application code, it deployed a service account and a role binding. And if I uh, look at the contents of that role binding, oops, role binding, Gotti cow powers. Oh, I need an extra T. Always helps if I spell things right. So we can see that service account was bound to a role that has admin privileges. This is definitely not something you want people to be just doing, right? <laughs> and because I didn't look at that YAML before I deployed it, I didn't notice that this was going to happen. Giant security hole. OK. It would be a good idea if we had something to stop that um, service account from being created. And then if we couldn't create a service account, we wouldn't have these permissions. Incidentally, the default service account is, uh, has very, very few permissions, so we wouldn't be able to do too much with that. So how could I prevent this service account from being created? I could use an admission controller. There are lots of different types of admission controller, and what I'm going to use is a, it's called a validating webhook admission controller. So an API request gets made. Uh, here's the definition of my validating webhook admission controller. In my case, I'm going to look for the creation of service accounts. When we see a request to create a service account, it's going to send a webhook to my admission controller. And I had to write some code to put this admission controller together. It's I'd probably like 300 lines of code. I'm not going to show you all of it, but um, basically it's a web server. It receives a mission review. You can look at it on GitHub, by the way. It's fine. And if it's a service account, I'm going to say this is not allowed. Not allowed. Not going to allow a service account to be created. OK, so let's kind of start again by deleting I've actually got a local copy of this thing so that I don't have to keep downloading it from the internet. So we've reset ourselves, and I'm going to put that admission controller in place. OK. And now, if I try to apply my totally fine YAML that I downloaded from the internet, it gets denied. I can't create the service account. My admission controller did its job. And uh, I now don't have the application running, and I can't just go into my Gotti Cow powers and magically create bad things in the cluster. So, admission control, validating webhook admission controllers are super powerful. We could write them to do anything we like. But I had to write like 300 lines of code to do a really simple thing like just stop blocking service accounts. And it would be kind of crazy if we all had to write our own custom admission controllers for doing really standard things. Enter Open Policy Agent. So the Open Policy Agent is a sandbox project. And we can use it. It, it acts as an admission controller, one of these validating webhook admission controllers. And it can be a much easier way of defining the rules that we want to apply. So I'm just going to delete uh, the things that I basically reset. I need to delete the admission controller that I just set up. And I've actually
actually already got uh, an open policy agent running, but I just don't have any rules defined yet. And this is the rule that I can set up to say, don't allow me to create a service account. It's just nine lines of code instead of several hundred. Much, much easier to deal with. And rather than having to build this into an image and deploy it as a, uh, well, as an application, I can load this file as a config map into OPA. So uh, we're going to create a config map. It goes in the OPA namespace. And I have, oh, I need to say from file. From file. Let's check that that looks right. What do you think? Do you think it's going to be all right? Config map. Okay, so, okay. So I have a config map that includes my rule that says, don't let me create any service accounts. And now if I run my uh, apply, if I try and apply my random YAML that I downloaded from the internet, again, it's not permitted, and it's not permitted because my open policy agent applied that rule and didn't accept that request. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So we can use admission controllers, potentially the open policy agents, to check that when we if we are going to deploy some random YAML that we've downloaded from somewhere, that it meets some rules that we want to specify. And we probably want to have much more complex or sophisticated or meaningful rules than what I just showed in a demo to say, let's just have a blanket ban on service accounts. The open policy agent is still in the sandbox, so I'm considering it kind of experimental, and to be honest, I'm just learning about it. But from what I've seen so far, it looks like a promising way to define these kind of rules that might save ourselves from these crazy things that we might download. So what kind of rules would we like to be enforcing when we deploy application code? It's a good idea to check that the application images come from a registry that we expect. And actually, the container spec YAML that defines what image to run can potentially be another attack vector. As a human being, it's pretty hard to spot the, the difference between these two. We might never spot if a bad actor set up a registry with a very slightly different URL than the one we intended to use. So having some kind of automated check that the image we're pulling, uh, the image comes from a registry that we expect, we can automate that check. That would be a lot more reliable. Who's checking their images for vulnerabilities? Who's using some kind of image scanner? Hands up. I want to see some hands, because you should all be doing this. OK, right. There are plenty of free scanners out there. There's no excuse. Known vulnerabilities in dependencies that you're probably including in your application images are probably the biggest source of uh, exploits that attackers can take advantage of. So use an image scanner to make sure you're not deploying known dependencies. And then you could use a check at admission control time to check that the image has been scanned and that the results didn't show some kind of terrible, terrible vulnerability in that image. Because if it did, you really don't want to deploy it. You also might well want to check whether the image that you're about to deploy is actually the image that you think it is by checking an image signature. If you can perform all these checks before you run a container image, it would make it a lot less likely that you're going to end up running some kind of terrible vulnerability that an attacker can exploit. OK, now, I don't want to scare you, but basically any code can have problems. And sometimes, even when it comes from a trusted source, it can still be very problematic, and particularly as the world is using more and more open source software 
that trust might be misplaced, we have to be very careful who we trust. Who's using Node? If you're using Node, you very likely are familiar with this problem from just a couple of weeks ago. So there's this Node library. It's maintained by one person. And he didn't really have any incentive to carry on looking after it. And somebody volunteered to take, a, take on administration of that Git repo, take on uh, maintenance of that library. And this original maintainer was like, well, I don't really want to do it anymore. So yeah, sure, here you go, admin privileges, off, off you go. And unfortunately, the person that he handed over to was a bad actor, and he put a cryptocurrency miner into that library, which was then downloaded by a lot of people. So this is where community can be really important when we're in this open source world. We need governance to ensure we don't just hand administrative privileges to some random person we just met on the internet five minutes ago. Foundations like the Linux Foundation and the CNCF, <laughs> they're not just here to organize glitzy events and corral vendors into sponsoring them and, and giving us all free t-shirts. The foundations are also there to help us coordinate as a community. And one of the things that they do is help us ensure we've got proper governance in place. That proper governance makes it much harder to hand the admin privileges to some random dude. <laughs> and this is increasingly important as we have businesses relying on open source software. We need our foundations to help ensure that people are incentivized to do the right thing and that we have the right processes in place to make sure that projects are maintained responsibly. The product, uh, product security team that we have in Kubernetes is a really great example of that working well. It's that good governance in place. They reacted really fast, got that uh, vulnerability patched really quickly. Good governance is a big part of how, as a community, we can collectively save ourselves from attack. If you'd like to learn more about Kubernetes security, top Ambassador Michael Hausenblast and I have recently written a book on the topic, and you can pick up a free copy if you swing by the Aqua booth. We're going to be signing some copies in the atrium this afternoon at 2.30 as well. Be careful what you deploy, people. <laughs> Thank you very much.